Happy Halloween weekend. A great time to sit down with some popcorn and watch a scary movie. Or if you're a game dev, work on your horror game. Thanks for joining me again on this devlog number four. Since last time, I've mainly worked on some inventory, back to doors, unsurprisingly, and worked on AI. If you like what I'm doing, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and leave me a comment down below. Let me know what you like, what you don't like, or even just to say Happy Halloween. It lets me know how I'm doing, and I would really like to see this channel grow. I had wanted to add text to the screen to show when a player picked up an item. So using a widget, I made it so that the text would fade out on the screen after it had been there for a period of time. And using the same database for the other item properties, I added the text for it to call upon. It was the same process with the item sounds. Each item in the table could have a specific sound linked to it so that when you picked up the item, it would play the given sound. Most of the items will have the same sound. Here I used kind of a stuff into a bag. Keys, however, I wanted to have a different sound associated with them. What a surprise, I'm working on doors some more. I wanted to be able to have a locked door and a key associated with that door. Here I'm working on setting a bullion to determine whether or not the door is locked. If the door is locked, it will play that locked sound and the door won't budge. I'll work on adding an animation later, maybe to make the door jiggle a little bit or if the door has a handle to make the handle jiggle a little bit, just to further indicate that the door is locked. I'm sure I've made this really confusing on myself, but right now the way to interact with the door comes in the pick up item function. This is a function that I already had in my interactable interface. However, because the character is set up to use the pickup item function in the interactable interface, whenever you press the E key, it seemed logical to keep the same function, even though now it's working on a door instead of an item. You're not picking up the door, of course, but when you press the key, it will pull up this pickup item and it will follow this tree. So here, when you press the key, it goes to the true or false branch. If the door is locked, then it will proceed to the next branch. This branch checks to see if you have a specific item within your inventory. In this case, it's the brass key. If you have the brass key, then it will go to play a sound of the door unlocking and it will set the door's state to unlocked and then finish the branch. If you don't have the brass key, then it will do the same thing as if you tried to open the door without the key and play the locked sound. If I start here in front of the gate, the key is here on the floor. If I try to open this gate normally, it just plays a sound indicating that the door is, is locked. I can press the E key to try to unlock it, but because I don't have the key in my inventory, it's still going to play that locked sound. If I go here and pick up the key, and press the E key next to the door, the door is now unlocked, and I can open it as normal. When I first implemented this way of unlocking doors, I thought to myself, well, it's not really an efficient method of doing it because I'll have to create a new blueprint for every locked door because the code itself contains what key I need. I don't know why I didn't think of it until now to just create a variable containing the key name. When you make that variable instance editable, here in the editor it shows key name. So if I type brass key here, that's the item that it will look for in your inventory. If, however, I put gold key, 
The gold key doesn't exist in the game currently. So here I will pick up the brass key. The brass key doesn't work. But if I rename this to brass key as the key that the door is looking for, it accepts the key. This is just a skin that I downloaded off of Mixamo. It took forever to try to figure out how to apply the animations from the advanced locomotion system to the Mixamo model without jumping through so many hoops. Eventually, I just discovered this retarget pose from Mesh. It's applied only to this model, and it takes this retargeter and applies it to the monster. Then on the monster's blueprint, even though we have the ALS model here, the monster skin uses this separate animation class that uses that retargeter, whereas the mesh still uses the same blueprint that came with the locomotion system. So all we do during the game is hide this mesh and show the mesh that's sitting right on top of it. So although this won't be the final model used in the game, the mechanics behind it will be the same. So I started looking into AI again with tutorials. It began with this behavior tree. The way this works, this selector starts at the top and moves counterclockwise to determine what the actor is going to do. In this case, it would start with a roam. It will pick a random location within a given area and move to that. The monster controller contains senses that you can add. In this case, I have added a sight sense and a hearing sense. You can also adjust the parameters of the senses. They begin with a 90 degree radius and I decrease that to 45, just so that the creature won't see you completely out of peripheral vision. Using these senses, it goes through the behavior tree. Here, the next option is whether or not it can hear the player. When it does, I've chosen for it to play a sound, and then it will perform this task. If the monster could see the player, it would execute these two tasks. First, find the player, and then chase the player. The find player task would get the location of the player character, set that location, and then in the chase task, I would tell the monster to begin running rather than walking and go to the location of the player. At the end of the day, I had some trouble getting this behavior tree to work exactly as I wanted it to, particularly with the hearing and the seeing of the players. The monster either didn't want to move to the area that I told it to completely without going back to a previous task, or it would get stuck on a task and just kind of stand there. So I decided to drop the behavior tree altogether, go entirely into the monster behavior blueprint, move all of the tasks into this blueprint, and then have the controller handle everything. When the game starts, this monster controller will get the controlled pawn, which in this case is the monster character, and it will then begin this task of getting random location. The getting random location will then find a position within the nav mesh that triggers this event, which will move to the location. Here is the perception tree. This is where I get whether or not the monster can hear or see the player. It actually took a lot of searching within videos and forums to see how to break apart the senses. If you look at this particular node, the only thing it says is whether or not a player was successfully sensed. I found that using these equal nodes under the class for stimulus, I could set whether or not the stimulus was sight or hearing. From here I can tell it to do different things, whether or not the monster hears you or sees you. If the monster sees you, it's going to go to the find player event. Whereas if it hears you, it's going to go to the heard noise event. When it hears a noise, first it's going to rotate to the direction of the noise. It will then play the growl sound, and it will move to the location. 
I again had some difficulty of whether or not the monster reached the location of the noise. So I had to set here the sound location and the actor's location. If they are roughly equal, then it will proceed to the next step. In this case, loop back to roaming. Here the chase player event is roughly the same as it was in the behavior tree tasks. It was a good bit of work, but I feel it really pays off. So here is the small room I created just to test everything. It's basically just a square with an inside room. The green is the nav mesh. A nav mesh indicates where an AI can move or find locations to move during the course of play. You'll notice I have the nav mesh set to update during play. So for instance, if a door were to open, the nav mesh will recalculate. And as long as there's at least a little strip of green and the actor can fit through the space, it can walk through. It was important to figure this out because during play, I found that when the monster would find a random location, occasionally it would find that random location within this room. And because the green went through the door, it would think that it could walk that path. However, the door prevented it from doing that. So it would just stand in front of the door and do nothing until the next loop came around. Here we can see I've set up the print string so that it tells me when he's roaming just for testing purposes. So anytime that loop came around to get a new location, it will trigger the print screen and tell me that he's roaming. Now I've set it up so that the character doesn't make any noise when he's walking. However, if I were to run or sprint, then I will make noise. And the monster should growl and try to come to my location. There he comes. I'll try to run away. He will hear me again. He's coming this way. There he sees me, so he starts running. keep trying to run away. Right now the monster can't open doors. So that will cut his path off. He won't even think that he can move that way. Oh, so he has looped around the other way. I perhaps made him too smart. I've spoken too soon. So here he is stuck in a loop somewhere, which I will have to try to fix. If I press the sprint key, it will, will get him out of that. Because he will try to come and find me again. When he does reach me, however, the character will ragdoll to the floor. All in all, though, a good test. Adding these nodes to make sure that the creature gets to where he's trying to go before continuing has really helped the quote-unquote skill of the AI to find the player. That stalling is probably probably within this number. I need to do some more research on how exactly this works. We did see there that the monster will continue to try to find the player as long as the monster continues to hear the player or the monster sees the player. Because the sprinting makes noise, which I'll tweak a little bit, but at least in that given room, 
Anytime the character is sprinting, the monster will try to find a location to the sound, not necessarily the player. It might be fun to make it so that the monster can actually open doors. I've also made it so that the, the doors themselves will make noise. So if I open a door, there the monster growls because he's heard the noise. Closing the door will also trigger. That will wrap up this update. Thank you for all your support. So until next time, remember to always carry a light into the darkness. <laughs>